Good morning. Good morning. I am so pleased that we can all make it this morning. We've been really keeping an eye on the, on the storm that's coming, and uh, apparently uh, the rain mixed with sleet could be here around noon today. So we're going to cut this a little bit short so that we're not pushing everybody to get home. It takes me about 40 minutes to get home. So uh, we'll try to, try to do that to, to prevent to, uh, people from being on the highway. To update everybody, Calvin and Peggy come in a little late, so we're going to update them just a little bit on everybody. Uh, Maria and Gilmer are past the, the COVID. COVID. They had it. They had an infusion at the hospital in Louisa, and after the infusion, they improved greatly, and it looks like they're over the hump and on their way to being well again. Marie said they probably wouldn't be back until about March, so because they want to make sure they get everything out of their system before they expose anybody else in any way whatsoever. Richard's not feeling good today. He's trying to stay away from everybody, so that's why I help cheer and, and uh, he, he loves everybody. He wants to shake everybody's hand, hug everybody's neck, but he don't feel comfortable with doing that today, so let's, let's kind of help him out with that. Of course, John's arthritis is still bothering him. Dylane is uh, doing better. She had planned on coming today, but Leyland got COVID, COVID, I keep saying COVID, COVID, uh, COVID, and she has now been released from the doctors that she's okay to go back to school starting this week. So they said, she said she wouldn't be here today, but she'll try her best to be here next Sunday. So let's remember all those people, and we're also really glad that Calvin was able to make it, seeing that he had a problem this week also. And, and, and we thank God that you were able to be here with us tonight, along with everyone else. I can do all things through God who strengthens me. Jesus said, Behold, the fields are white, ready for the gathering, ready for the harvest. Today I find it difficult to find the harvest white. I don't know about you all, but I have a real problem seeing a white harvest out there. A white harvest means the crops have bloomed, they're ready to go, they're ready to take in and secure. And of course we know the crop he's talking about is, is, the, is the, the world at that time, that they, they were ready to, be, to hear the word of God and be brought into God's kingdom. That was a period of time when people were hungry for religion. They were hungry for a purpose in life. They had lived their life existence mostly under the Pharisees. And they weren't happy at all with that because they could see a lot of hypocrisy there. Of course, Jesus tells them it was there. So it comes to a point that is the crop really white and ready to harvest now. I think we live in a generation of godless people. And we present the gospel to them. Now, what I'm saying, I never give up. We never give up on preaching the gospel, teaching the gospel. But I believe this might be a period of time in history which has been the worst that we've ever had for preaching the word of God to anybody. There is so much false religion out there that looks so good that people feel blessed with that. And they end up being blessed with something other than spiritual. So we need to grow. Each and every one of us need to grow spiritually. We're going to look at six requirements for spiritual growth. I got this lesson from a, a Donnie Barnes. He does what's called Barnes Charts. I don't know if anybody's ever seen them or not. Uh, they're excellent. They're excellent to study with and you can work with them sometimes and work them into a lesson or a sermon and they work out fine. Donnie Barnes has passed away since then, so there's no new ones coming out, but, but he's got thousands of them, so I mean, they're, they're there for the, for the study. And if you haven't seen them on the internet and would like to, you need to look up Bible Charts by Donnie Barnes, and they're excellent, and you'll see one of them here. In order to have spiritual growth, there's some things that's required, and we're going to mention six of them here. These are required with everybody. One that I've not got up there that, that I feel a, a need to mention at this time is, is the fruit of the Spirit. And 
says the fruit of the Spirit is joy, love, and so forth and so forth. It mentions nine things. If you notice that, it says, it mentions it as singular. The fruit of the Spirit, not the fruits of the Spirit. And one thing I'll need us to understand about that, it says the fruits of the Spirit are love, joy, and it goes on and mentions a whole bunch of things. How do we reconcile that? Because we're not the fruit of the, we've not got the fruit of the Spirit until we've got all of them. All of them are one. Either you've got the fruit of the Spirit and you have all those characteristics, or you don't have the fruit of the Spirit. It's not nine different things you try to collect and get. It's something that becomes a part of our life. It changes when we become a member of the body of Christ. Now let's look at these six requirements. The first one I want to mention is spiritual food. I find it difficult. I was a health teacher and I believe in, in the nutritional value of food. I believe it's important to eat breakfast in the morning in order to get you a boost and get you started. I believe it's important to take in as many natural vitamins and, vi and minerals as you possibly can. What if you went a week without eating? physical food. You'd be on the edge of starvation. But yet we got people that'll go months without spiritual food. They'll go months without having any type of the study of God's Word within themselves. So they have no spiritual food, so they begin to be, be, be malnutrished. They don't have what they need. First Peter 2 and 2 said, we need to be as newborn babes, desire the sincere milk of the Word that you may grow thereby. How can we expect to grow as a Christian if we don't take in the nutrition of the Bible, of the Word of the Bible? If we don't take it in, we can't put it out. Without that nutrition, we'll die. You know, uh, without food, we can go about a week and not be, I mean, we could survive a week, but you know, you can't survive but a day or two without water. You can't survive spiritually at all without the Word of God. So we need to take that in and we need to do it as much as we possibly can. Look at what, what the writer of Hebrews chapter 5 verse 12 said. He said, for when the time ye ought to be teachers. Think of that statement. For the time you ought to be student, teachers. You've been a Christian long enough is what he's saying. <coughs> You've been a member of God's family, a Christian long enough that you ought to be teaching other people. That's basically what he's saying. For when the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that, that one teach you again, uh, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are, are become such as, as have need of milk and not strong, uh, strong meat. In other words, they can't handle the truth. They've got to be baby. They've got to be padded. They've got to be taken care of. As some people are like that. Verse 13, for everyone that uses milk is, is, uh, that uses milk is unskilled, in the word of righteousness. What's that mean? That means they don't know the word of God. That's simple. For he is made. But look at verse 14. This is what we need to be. But strong meat belongs to them that are of full age. Now that don't mean 60 years old. That means they've studied the word of God as they've, as they've come along and they've grown. They're of full age. Even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to disconcern both good and evil. How do we disconcern both good and evil? We exercise the Word of God. We read the Word of God. We study the Word of God. And if you'll look here, nowhere does the Bible tell us to just read the Word of God. It tells us to study the Word of God. To meditate on the Word of God. That's what the Bible tells us to do. And if we don't get that spiritual food in our bodies, we're going to begin to fall apart. Too many people today spiritually are taking in junk food. And I really mean junk food. And when they get that junk food in their body, their body doesn't grow the way it should, so it's growing the wrong direction. We need spiritual food. We need the food from the Word of God and the truth. When we have that, when we get that Word of God that's the truth, the spiritual food that we need, then we have the ability, the freedom from disease. Now, what kind of disease are we talking about? 
We're talking about the disease that is the greatest cause of death in the world. You know, cancer used to be number one. Number one death. Automobile accidents. A lot of people die there. But do you know what? Those people can still be alive with God. Romans 6 and 23 it says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. Death is the greatest disease, or sin is the greatest disease that there is. It takes more lives. It takes more souls. It takes more souls go to hell than go to heaven. We already know that. We've read the Bible. We know what it said. So we have to figure out the way that so what we have to get out of our lives in order that this disease doesn't destroy us. One is a disease of neglect. Neglecting God. Neglecting family. When you neglect family, you, ne you neglect God. Because God put us in families. He said these families are to work together. Uh, the husband and the wife to work together. The children are to work with the family, and they're all to work together. So if you if you if you neglect your family, you neglect God. Neglecting Bible study, neglecting assembling together, just neglecting all the things that God has commanded us to do. Look at Hebrews chapter two, verse three. It said, "How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation?" which at the first began to be spoken of by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that hear of Him. I can't imagine neglecting to do the things that are my responsibility. We all have done that from time to time in our lives. I know that we have. We've neglected to do what we should do. That's why our house begins to rot and fall down sometimes, some people. That's why our cars don't run like they should. But that kind of neglect is not going to affect our souls. That's not the disease we're worried about. We're just worried about the disease of sin that separates us from God. So when we neglect those things that God has told us to do, to gather together upon the first day of the week, to partake of the Lord's Supper, to give back as we have prospered, to teach our neighbors to love our neighbors as ourselves and to love God about all things. When we neglect to do the things that we're required to do by God, then that disease begins to take over. Sin takes over our lives and destroys us. There's also the disease of worldliness. My, my, my two neighbors both got boats, so I gotta get me a boat. My neighbor down the road got them a new camper. I need a new camper. My, my, my camper's two years old, it's too old. I need a new one. Worldliness takes a hold of us. I truly believe this, that it can be one of the worst things in your life. And that's the TV. That's the internet. They can be prosperous to us. They can help us. They can help us to understand what's going on in the world. They can help us to find them. The, the, the internet's got some of the best Bible study tools you could ever find in your life. But it's got some of the filthiest stuff on it to destroy your life. And people see this and then they want it. They want that what everybody else has got. They don't want anybody to be ahead of them. 1 John 2 and 15, Love not the world, neither the things in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Now what that means, it doesn't mean you can't want things in the world. It says when you put the world behind, ahead of God. That's what it's talked about. If any man loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. You can't love up. You can't serve God and mammon both. You have to choose between them. Satan will take any part of you you want. Any part of your life that you'll give to Satan, Satan will grab it right now and take care of it. He'll want it. God won't accept not anything less than all of it. Satan will take anything. God has to have everything. Verse 16, for all that is in the world, the lust of the eyes, the, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passes away, and the lust are of. But he that does the will of God abideth forever. You know what this lust is? 
It's a desire to have the things of the world, the things you see, the things you hear about, to have be over top of other people, to think you're better than other people. That's what all these things of the world does. And it destroys you little bit by little bit. Sometimes you don't even realize it until you're already gone. It's like, like getting in a boat and drifting down the river. You don't even realize you're moving. You're just laying there, just floating, so happy. Not realizing what's going on in the world. And by the time you get to the end, it's too late. That's what the desires of the world do. They, they take us in and, and, and they, they destroy who we are. So what does it do? Sin takes over. The disease takes over. And death is a result of that. A third one. The disease of the love of popularity. That's such a driving force. Sometimes when people become popular and well known, they want to be more well known. That's why you see some politicians, even after they're no longer in office, they still try to be in the limelight all the time. They want people to see them. That's when you see actors that's 95 years old and should have retired 20 years ago are still acting because they want to be seen. They want to be known. They'll push their names out there. They'll get involved as many things as they can in order for other people to see them. And also, there's so many people... I'm trying to remember the guy's name. I can't remember. Waldo told me. I can't remember. He had read an article on the person, and, and he said that that person said, uh, admitted that baptism was necessary, but if he taught baptism, he'd lose his followers. It might have been Max Lucado. I don't know. It was... Say it out loud, John. Billy Graham. Billy Graham. Okay. I knew I'd, I'd read that. I think Waldo was the one mentioned it to me. But, but, but people want, they don't want anybody, they, they want to be ahead of everybody else. In, in the book of John, chapter 12, verse 42, the gospel is preached to, to, to everybody under the sun. And in and, and the Colossians, chapter 2, verse 23, it says, preached to every preacher under the sun. These people had heard the gospel. It said, nevertheless, among the chief rulers also many believed on him. They believed. Were they believers? No. They believed on Him, but they weren't believers. Believers are Christians. So they believed on Him, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess Him. Lest they should be put out of the synagogues. For the love of the praise of men more than the praise of God. I hate to be in a situation where I thought it was more important what men said about me than what God said about me. It would really bother me. It would scare me. To think that it was more important. <clears throat> the Bible teaches that preachers preach for God. If eldership, which we don't have eldership, if eldership ever tries to tell the preacher what to preach, the preacher needs to move on. Because they don't have the authority to do that. Now if he preaches in error, they have the right to correct him. But when they try to get him to preach a certain doctrine the way they want to preach, no. There's also those in the world today, and I'm, I'm really sad about this one because most of them are the members of the body of Christ. The disease of being lukewarm. Ah, that's okay. I can accept that. We'll, we'll, we'll do that. I, I know the Bible says we're not supposed to do that, but we'll, we'll do it. It's okay. Oh, I'll go, I'll go to church next month. I, I, I don't need to be in any rush. I, I, I've been there been there last month, so I, 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 I can go wait till next month to go again. Oh, besides that, I've got all I, I know all I need to know about the Bible. I don't even need to study it anymore. It's every bit up here. I've got it all. Me and God's got it all worked out. Revelation chapter 3, verse 15 through 17. And God, Jesus said, I know thy works, and thou art neither hot nor cold. I would that thou... I would that thou were to cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew you out of my mouth. In other words, you make me sick. 
People who are lukewarm makes God sick to his stomach to the point that he can't hardly hold it down. Think of that statement. Think of that statement about a lukewarm person. They make God sick to the stomach. In verse 17 he said, Because thou sayest, listen to what they say, I am rich and increased in goods and have need of nothing. And notice now, not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. All of that being spiritually. They're spiritually wretched. They're spiritually miserable, spiritually poor, blind, and spiritually naked. And they don't even realize it. Because their head's so high in the cloud, they don't worry about it. They've got what they need. Disease. Again, the disease of sin is one that destroys eternally. It's not one that just puts you in a physical grave. It can put you in a physical grave. But that sin is so horrible that it's eternal separation from God. So the question is, what can we do to avoid that sin? God made it so simple. So simple. Number one, studying the Word of God. Now look at what it says. It says study. Don't read. Don't just read. Study. Don't put your Bible where everybody can see it just to make them think you read it. Study it. And that's what we have to do. We can't be approved of God if we don't study. Study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. This scripture... I guess has been my most favorite scripture since I can remember. You cannot determine the word of truth if you don't study. How many times have you read the Bible, read a section of the Bible, you read it, you get it down pat in your head, and you got it made, you know the answer. You go back next week and read it again, you say, oh, I looked at that wrong. That didn't mean that. That means this. That's why you have to study. We're humans. We make mistakes. We put things in our heads and we can't get them cleared out right. So we need to go back and study the Word of God God again. And continually study the Word of God. Never give up. Never determine that you know enough about anything in the Bible to not study it anymore. It wouldn't hurt us to have a sermon on baptism every month. We'd learn more. We'd understand more. And not just baptism, but any subject you can pick up. We need to study it as much as we can. It never gets old. Repetition, repetition, repetition. And we know more about God's Word than we ever would before. We also need to exercise. Exercise means to use the Word of God. To use it by spreading it to other people. To use it to direct your own life. To use it to help everybody that we possibly can. To help, to, to, we need to use the Bible to, to, so, so that God approves us. That we can glorify God more because when someone asks, we need to be prepared. And that's what it tells us in the Bible. Always be ready to give an answer to those who question your hope. We can't do that if we don't exercise. It's just like in, it's, it's like in the physical world. If you don't exercise, what happens to your muscles? They get weak. So what happens to our soul if we don't exercise the Word of God? We get weak. So exercise is important. A fourth, another thing. I didn't have that up there, did I? Did you get that down, Peggy? No, no. It's a proper environment. I'm going to tell you right now, except in unusual circumstances, a bar is not a place for a Christian to be. Don't ever condemn someone that you see as a Christian going in. They may be going in to, they may be going in to save a soul. So we have to be careful about accusing someone or judging someone because we see them in a place we don't think they should be. A Christian has no, no need or right whatsoever to be in a denominational church. I mean, visiting one. I don't think you, there are no Christians in a denominational church. So I don't mean that in a church building or associating in that situation. It's okay to go there and visit. I mean, if, if there's no worship service going on, and like me and John, it was no longer a church when we went. 
but we went and looked at, at, at new uh, benches. And we went into another, I don't know what kind of church it was, had six or seven pianos in it. So it wasn't where I wanted to be. But we went in the building. The, if someone saw me and John go in there and knew we were preachers it was the Church of Christ, they may condemn us for that. They shouldn't, but they might. So the right environment's important. The people that you associate with are so important. Now don't think I'm saying we need to pull ourselves away from the world like a monk and not associate with people. We can't convert the world if we don't associate with the world. But look what Paul wrote. Be not deceived. Evil communication corrupts good manners. Evil communication means an evil lifestyle. Corrupts good manners. That means the way we live our lives. The way we live our lives. If we go around someone that is constantly throwing out foul language, it's going in. It's going to come out sometime. And probably at the wrong time. Well, if it comes out all at the wrong time. So we need to be in the proper environment. This is the proper environment. In a home that's loving and kind, is a proper environment. I got a thing I want to, I, I wish I had it. I'll, 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 I'll send you one, John. Anybody's got an email, I mean, um, Facebook, I can send it to you. I think it was my cousin, Colin, my sister in law. She put a picture, pictures up on the, on the internet, Facebook. And it shows this man with a cell phone in his hand, and his two kids are here, and they're ghost like. You can't hardly see them, they're faded away. And it shows four or five pictures of people like that, people with kids. So three kids in a room, two of them on, on the cell phone, the other one standing there, and they're almost fading to what? The message it was getting across is cell phone separation. I've seen people sitting in the same room together, four or five people and half of them on a cell phone. Not communicating together at all, just on a cell phone. That breaks down the communication in a home and a family. There is nothing wrong with the cell phone if you use it the right way. So a proper environment, and the environment is not just the people you're with, but the conditions of the environment. The final thing I have this morning is time. For some reason or other, we get it in our minds that we've got all the time in the world. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. Now is the time. There's no time like the present to do the right thing in your life. But time is the thing we can't ever give up on. Romans chapter 13 verse 11. And that now, knowing the time. And again, like I said, in this time in the world it seems like there's more People are farther from gone than they ever have been. So let's know that time. We're at a time of heathens. We're people who are anti-God. And that knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believe. It's important that we do everything that we can to avoid the greatest disease in the world, and that's sin. And we have to put forth an effort for that. We have to study. We have to exercise. We have to be in the right in the right frame of mind. We have to be in the right places. And we have to take advantage of every opportunity we can. Because that, uh, when you miss an opportunity, you may never get it again. We need to grow. And we need to make every effort we can to grow in the way that God tells us to. Growing in the grace of God. This is a little different than what I mentioned a while ago about the uh, uh, fruits of the Spirit. The fruits of the Spirit, we've got them all at one time. When we become a Christian, those fruits are there. If we let them rot and fall away, then we, then we, then we lose it all. But these things we grow in. We grow in the grace of God continually by doing the things He's told us to do. If you're here this morning, by your question. If you're here this morning and along your path, your journey to God, you've made a mistake and fallen away. You've let this disease get inside your body. This disease of sin. You've allowed it in. 
And it don't come in unless you allow it. You've allowed this sin to come into your body. And it's eating away at you. It's destroying you from the inside out. Then you need to do something about that. Ever what it is that separates yourself, you from God, you need to do something about it today. And the only thing you can do is ask, is repent of it and ask God for forgiveness and go welcome you back. And you can be in that journey back to being with God. If anyone here needs to answer the call, let us know while we all stand and while we sing.